Well, what's up, everybody? Man, was that worship set not just intense? Did anybody else just almost spontaneously combust like, like I did? So, uh, man, thank you. Thank you, worship team. Thank you, Jesus, for being awesome like that. Um, we we uh, are starting a new series today. Uh, Pastor Dennis is in South Africa, so I'm sure he's watching the live stream. So everybody say, hey, Dennis. Hey, Dennis. Say, hey, JoJo. Hey, JoJo. That's what Joanna's nickname is, So, uh, which, yeah, I might have just gotten in trouble because the whole church now should call her JoJo. Uh, but they're in South Africa preaching at a missions conference, and uh, we're, we're praying for them. Uh, we're excited just to, to be a part of global work for the gospel. A little church in North Wilkesboro, North Carolina. If you ever leave North Carolina and you say North Wilkesboro, North Carolina, you always have to say a few things because they go, where is that? You go, well, you know NASCAR? Yeah, well, it was started in Wilkes County. You know Lowe's, the corporate office, the Lowe's Home Improvement? Yeah, well, it started in Wilkes. And if you're still in North Carolina, you can say, do you know Lowe's Foods? Well, that started in Wilkes, too. You know, and then, of course, you have to go there. Do you know what moonshine is? <laughs> so, yeah, just a few staples. But uh, just this little church that I believe is getting ready to just continue to grow and explode for the gospel and do something way bigger than our name. In fact, it's going to be so big that the only name that we can use is the name of Jesus to give credit to it. And I'm excited to be a part of that, aren't you? Yeah, and we're just going to press in uh, because we just finished a series called Lit. And in that series, we talked about just personal revival, getting excited about what God is doing in our life, being obedient to Him and the power of His Spirit inside of every believer. Uh, and we finished that up last week. Pastor Dennis finished that, that series up, and we're starting a new series. Everybody say overflow. overflow. Just a natural result, and right out of our Lit series, we want to talk about what happens when we do get on fire, when that revival does start in our life. How does the overflow of that impact our world? And that's what we're going to kick off. We're going to do an overview this morning. Uh, and we're going to build off of that series. So if you've got a Bible, you can go ahead and turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 if you want to turn there. And as you turn there, I just want to talk to you for just a second. Everybody has inflow in their life. There's things that you take in, whether it be food or what you hear, what you see, what you think, what you, what you allow your mind to take in. And then there's outflow. What we want to do over the next four weeks is we want to talk about how to get the right inflow. Everybody say inflow. And therefore, we can have the right, everybody say outflow. The problem comes is either some of us aren't taken in enough so we have no outflow in our life. Some of us, it's not, the outflow is not a problem. It's what we're taking in. We have plenty going out, but what's going out is tainted, is poison to ourselves, poison to the world around us because the inflow is wrong. So we're going to sort of have an overview of that looking at 2 Corinthians because we got to realize that every one of us, we saturate the world around us. That's what our life does. Our, every one of us, whether it's apathy, whether we try to be lazy and do hardly anything, we saturate things around us. Whether we uh, do nothing but work all the time and we're workaholics, uh, then, then we saturate the world around us. And what I think is a key component to us impacting our culture and changing the face of the world is our inflow and our outflow. And our outflow can never be right, never, unless the inflow is right. And so I, I, I don't expect what we talk about today to be something easy to swallow because we're going to get really intricate and really deep down into the, the minute things of our life because every part of that matters to the Lord. The Lord doesn't set apart some of our life and say, okay, do with, you, with that what you want. If we've had that personal revival and He has lit us on fire for Him, then we're constantly trying to re-give our life back in control to His Spirit in our life. So I want to answer a question, and this, this is the question, how can I best impact the world? Now, I don't want to answer the question, how do I impact the world? I want to answer the question, how do I best impact the world? Because 
we all impact it. It's not a matter of whether or not you impact it. It's the matter of the quality and the quantity of your impact on the world. So uh, if you're taking notes, you can write this down. If you're on the YouVersion app, you can uh, just look along there. But how do I best impact the world? The first thing is by filtering what comes into my life. Now, this may become as a shock to you, but every one of us understand this principle, even if you're not a believer. There are, for every one of us, there is a filter in which we look through, in which we allow things to come into our life. Some of us is political. We have a political agenda, so the filter comes through our political view. Some of us, it's, it's, we're uh, you know, on a big health kick, and we let the filter come through that. Some of us, we're just on, we just like food kick, so everything comes through. We don't care about the health of it. Uh, some of us, it's our job, everything comes through that filter. Some of us who are parents, everything comes through the filter of parenthood. And what I want to do today is get to a place where we see that, that Jesus has to become that filter. He has to become the filter on our life. So we're going to go through 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to read 18 verses. Uh, we're going to break it up, but we're going to go through that. And I want to read verses 1 and 2. So when Jesus becomes the filter uh, by filtering what comes into my life, verse 1 says this, Therefore, since uh, through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we renounce secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we just distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. See, we have to... Decide that everything becomes a filter. Everything is filtered by Jesus in my life. Jesus becomes that forefront. See, religion always leads us to live a double, double life. And I know there's not a person who escapes this on some level. Every one of us, you put us in a different context. Sometimes it's with our spouse, it's with our children. Sometimes Jesus almost disappears. You know what I'm talking about? You ever just yell at a kid? He's just like, I will murder you. That wasn't very Christ-like. Or when you get around your friends at school and they start talking about sexual things or inappropriate things and you join right in with them. But then you, when you get around grandma, you ain't talking like that. She'll smack your mouth. You know it. Or when it comes to the way that you handle your finances or whatever it is that you do in your life. When you get alone. Maybe this alters and maybe Jesus isn't that filter. But Paul writes to the church in Corinth, his second letter to them. He says, we've got to get to this place where we renounce secret and shameful ways. We get that out front. It does not become a directing part in our life. We never distort the word of God. See, sometimes we ignore parts of God's word or we twist it to make it mean what we want. Let me give you an example. I was in a conversation just a couple weeks ago with somebody I'm very close with and this person uh, moved in with a girl and was having adult relations with him if you know what I'm saying and I, I approached this person in love and I said listen this is not God's plan. This is not what God desires for you. And, they, and this person said this because we, we grew up in, in the same church and had the same influence as they actually impact. I would not be sitting here today if it wasn't for this person. And here's what they said to me. And this is what happens when we start distorting the word of God and we start getting these secret shameful ways and we do not allow the word of God and Jesus to be, be the front filter of our life. They said, well, I know that we're living in sin, but... I believe God brought us together. Now, you don't need to make statements like that to a preacher. Because we go automatically theological and we want to go deep because we're like, wait, those two statements cannot exist in the same universe. God, because basically, let's put those two sentences together. God led us into sin.
Basically, what this person was saying is, I know I'm in sin because I feel the Holy Spirit convicting me, but I'm going to try to justify it and throw Jesus' dust on top of it. A few days later, that person told me to quit preaching at them. And I said, what am I... And, they, and, they, and I, it just led to a tweet this week, and the, I tweeted out this, and this just came out of that. It was... Some people want you to speak the truth, but they're not loving when they do it. And some people just want you to love and not speak the truth. But do you realize that those two things cannot exist either without each other? If you speak the truth and you don't do it loving, it was no longer the truth. And if you try to be real loving to people living in sin and you don't speak the truth to them, then you weren't very loving. They coexist together because they never separate because that's who God is. He is truth and He is love. And sometimes it's hard to swallow that. And even as a parent or a spouse or, or as a friend, it's hard to confront somebody. And I can tell you in 18 years of ministry, most people leave the church when you approach them with truth. They just want you to come and love. But you cannot love somebody without the truth. And the truth without love is not love. So you have to... And love confront people with the truth because that becomes the filter. The filter of truth is love and the, the filter of love is truth. And when we renounce sh secret and shameful ways, we will say, well, you know what? I am living in sin. I need help. If you ever know that you're living in sin in any part of your life and you end that with but, that's exactly what it is. And we need to get to that place where we trust God and we don't distort the word of God. And Paul goes on to say, on the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul says, we put our life out in the open so people can judge us. Brian, people are not supposed to judge. That is not what the Bible says. Again, you've distorted the word of God. Well, Jesus said, don't judge lest you be judged. Exactly. Exactly. And he says, by the measure that you judge somebody. So Jesus either contradicted himself or he's saying, you need to take care of your own junk before you help somebody else in their junk. Or you need to say, hey, let's go get help with our junk together. Now, in Luke, here's the words of Jesus. Luke chapter 6, verse 43. You'll see it up on the screen. He says, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Everybody understands this logic. Each tree is recognized by its what? What kind of fruit? Own, its own fruit. Apple tree, apples. Second you see oranges on an apple tree, there's something wrong. That's a different universe. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings the good. So Jesus takes two lines of logic. Here's illustration of a tree. You understand that, don't you? Yes. And then he says this, because he knows that we understand this too, but we justify our way out of it. He said the good man brings the good things out of the good stored up in his what? Heart. And the evil man brings evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, his heart, his mouth speaks. That's a tough one to swallow. Because most of us, if we're honest, in our heart, unfiltered, it is evil. In fact, can I say all of us, in our hearts, if it's unfiltered by God, it is evil. And evil comes out of our life. Either it's wrong motives, and you do good things with wrong motives, or you just do terrible things with Terrible motives. But Jesus says, out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Nobody escapes that. I believe this is key to what, how we're impacting our world. One of my favorite passages, and I'm, this, I hope you memorize 2 Corinthians 10, 5. Paul says this to the same church of six chapters later. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it, to make it obedient to Christ. See, 
Um, it was a couple years into ministry, I don't know when, but I've had several epiphanies when I come across a verse and I almost get offended when I see something that was epic and nobody ever taught it to me. This was one of those verses because I was coming out of a, a lifestyle of being sexually active outside of marriage and addiction to pornography. I was drinking a lot on the weekends and then Jesus just wrecked my life for the good and I, I had to figure out how to filter a lot of stuff because there was a lot of stuff in there. So I spent a lot of time just freaking out because I'd have a bad thought and I'm like, Jesus, be my filter. Jesus, be my filter. But then something very, very liberating was shown to me in this verse. Because it, put it back up on the screen. Because it says this. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive how many thoughts? Every. That was liberating to me because I started thinking, well, Jesus, I'm not the one who determines what the good and the bad thoughts are. You get to be the filter of them all. Because when we look at it, our life is a lot like when God first made the, the world and he made everything in it. What ended up happening is our life was like just a, 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 a nice glass of water. In the beginning with Adam and Eve, it's pure. And the, their inflow and their outflow was all the same. They were taking in the relationship with God and the outflow and the result was just amazing. But then after sin entered and all of us have had sin enter into our life... Uh, our life become, became more like this. Just tainted, dirty. This is literally dirt, water. And that came into our life. There's some grass in there too. That is not like uh, chai leaves to make it look pretty, a garnish or anything. So you can actually see the mud in the bottom of this. Let me just get it all out of there. So. I didn't get it all out. Anybody want a glass of this? This is what our lives are like outside of Christ. We can do nothing when we take in the world. This is what the world brings into our life. But then when we give our life to Christ, He becomes the filter at the beginning. A lot of us, we like to put Jesus on the kitchen sink filter. We still have water coming into the bathroom and water coming into other areas of our house. But Jesus is on the sink. Because that's where everybody comes. They come into the kitchen. That's where people get to meet and gather. And you gather around the table and you eat. And everybody sees the Jesus filter there. But in the bathroom or in other parts of your house, maybe Jesus isn't the filter. What God wants to do is to come into our life. I've got a, a pump here. This is a camping, hiking pump. And it has a charcoal reservoir in it, and it allows you to do something like this. When Jesus becomes the filter of our life, he can take what you would not even dare drink. This is Wilkes County soil. There's probably old moonshine still remnants in this. Union school, there was no telling what the little elementary kids did outside. At least they spit, we know that. And see, Jesus becomes that filter and we see him take just the dirt out of our life and we see it travel and he becomes that filter. And out the other end, once it passes through him, he decides what comes into your life and what is clean and what is dirty and what you may not drink. He determines that. Because you live in the world. You, we're not monks. Even though sometimes that seems appealing. Up in a mountain. A, 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 away from people. Not talking to anybody with your Bible. How many of you that's tempting? Yes. Yes. Me too. At times. My, honey, you can come too, but you can't talk. <laughs> She's not going. So... But I want you to look at this. Now, this is the same water. The water that, that is in the world. We live in a broken world. You're in it. You're broken. And we take every thought captive and Jesus becomes that filter. You don't have to decide what's the good thoughts and the bad thoughts. We live in this world until Jesus filters them. There's probably at least a bad motive behind it. And you get pure, clean water. Ah. 
That was earthy. <laughs> Honey, I ate my vegetables. <laughs> Most of us aren't willing to do that. Because when we start filtering things in our life, it gets a little bit awkward. Let me tell you some few awkward things that happened to me early on in ministry that I decided to do. A lot of you know my testimony, but in seventh grade, I didn't even know I was going to be a pastor. But in seventh grade, uh, our youth group was disbanded because the, the youth pastor on national TV was arrested for molesting girls in our youth group. He's accused of that. So is it Bethlehem Baptist? And, and they shut down the youth group, and it was a tragic thing, and... I grew up in church. All my friends were in church. Then I started making friends outside of that, and I started seeing that there was more tainted water than what I was getting was still tainted because if Jesus isn't the filter, it's tainted. But what I was getting was less tainted because church people, sometimes we can drink a bitter glass, but it looks nice and clear. You know what I'm talking about? We got it together on the outside. We've got all the, the crunchies out, all the color out. But it's still, it, it's, it can still be poisonous. Well, I started making friends with, and just walked away from God. By the, by the age of 15, I took my first drink of alcohol. By the age of 17, I was partying, sleeping around, doing all kinds of stuff, dishonoring my family name and dishonoring the name of God. And, and I ended up getting to this place where I just wanted the full measure of God in my life. So I decided I was going to go into full-time ministry. I told the people that were mentoring me, I said, I'll never be a pastor. And they said, why not? I said, because I've seen how people treat the pastor, and I want nothing to do with that. I'll punch somebody in the throat. <laughs> I'm going to be an evangelist. That way I can come in and just try to preach repentance and restoration and hope to the church and then leave and let the pastor clean up the mess. And then God said, ha, 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 that's funny, you're a pastor. And I've been in the midst of the pain and the struggle and the joy and the fight and the glory of God in the church and just fighting for the hope of the world comes through the local church because we carry the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And I decided that I was going to let him filter everything. Here's the first thing that I did. I made a vow that I would never be alone with a female that I was not related to. Ever. Ever. You wouldn't be in my car. If you walked into my office, I'm walking out into a public area. Or somebody else is in that meeting or the door is open. And let me tell you what, in 18 years I've been in some of the most awkward situations because most people have no filter there. Why? Because I knew that I would never do anything. I was pretty sure the people I was around with that would never do anything. But I know that if my youth pastor got accused, I don't know if he did it. I'm, I, I was in seventh grade. But I know on national TV, he was accused of it. And I knew I was going to do everything I could to protect the church. And I was going to put a filter up that may be awkward. And if you can talk to a lot of the youth leaders in here, uh, just over the past years, just I've had an amazing volunteer staff over the years, but they know if you walk in Brian's office and you're female, he's going to get up and walk out into a public area as we talk. I'm just going to do it, and it's going to be awkward. I had one youth leader come up to me and say, Brian, uh, I thought you just didn't like me. And then I remembered what you said. It just was always awkward. It's going to be awkward. And sometimes putting a filter up when conversation is happening and you can't join in the way that your friends and coworkers are, when that filter isn't there, when you see some people partaking in things that may be harmful to your body, you need to get the pump out and let Jesus become the filter of everything. Take every thought captive and make it obedient to Jesus. So how do I, that's how I best, that's how we will best impact the world, is filtering everything. Nothing goes unfiltered. We get crazy about our water that way. Some of you will not drink Wilkes County tap water. It has to be filtered or bottled water, and some of you, you pay, and that's fine. I'm not making fun. I am making fun. Uh, but some of your bottles of water cost more than my sun drop. 
And I'm like, you pay a lot for spring water? <laughs> yeah, right. They, they pumped it out of the sewage plant and filtered it 12 times. No, they didn't, Brian. This is straight from the Alaska ice caps. <laughs> what happens when Jesus becomes the filter of everything? Well, write this down. When Jesus becomes my filter, Jesus is revealed in every area of my life. When Jesus becomes your filter, he becomes what is seen. Until then, the world sees this. When Jesus becomes your filter, they see this. They see purity. They see holiness. They see something different. They see something that brings life. They see something not tainted. They see something that makes them go, hmm, what is that? And when they see that, it becomes part of who we are. Look at 2 Corinthians back in chapter 4. We're going to pick up in verse 3. Paul says this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Let me pause right there and explain. Paul is saying that those who do not know Jesus, they can't have a relationship with God until they repent and believe in faith that He died for their sins and they receive Him as Lord, as Savior, as Master of their life. Until they do that, they cannot understand the gospel. It's foolishness to them. Verse 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Do not expect your lost friends to act like they know Jesus. But what I don't get is why do so many Christians act like our lost friends? If Jesus is the filter, something's got to be filtered, or otherwise Jesus isn't the filter. has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see, they cannot see the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So if they see Jesus, they see God. And Jesus is the hope of glory that lives inside of every believer. So they should see Jesus in you. They don't look at you and go, oh, you're Jesus. But they go, what is different about you? And then you say, that's definitely Jesus. Verse 5. For we do not preach ourselves. We'll actually dig into this verse in a couple of weeks even more. But Jesus Christ is Lord in ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, it, for God who said, let light shine out of the darkness. Made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed. This is a, just a beautiful turn of phrase that Paul uses. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not, everybody say crushed. Perplexed, but not, everybody say in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. This world brings all kinds of tainted mess they bring it all into our life and it, we become the filter and it never crushes us. It never puts us fully in despair. We bounce back. We overcome. We win. We don't win like we're against the world. We win against Satan. He hates God. He hates you. He hates the world. He wants everybody to be blinded by their selfishness and their sin. He does not want them to see the glory of God. But light shines out in the darkness. Darkness never shines into the light. Verse 10. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be revealed in our body. Until you understand that Jesus died for your sin and that death becomes part of your life where you died to that sin also then the life of Jesus can't be part of your life. Now, the life of Jesus, it is epically scary. Well, what do you mean, Brian? It's nothing like the world. And that scares us to death because it sets us apart. Some people will say, Jesus should be part of your private life. Don't bring that into the workplace or into school. But do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said he was everything in life. 
And I'm going with God on this one. And I'm hoping I continue to get the filter on the right parts of my life so Jesus can see, be seen in my life. Because that's what Paul said, let light shine out of the darkness. And then he says that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in my body. Everything about you, people should see Jesus. Now, this might be really sound like an epically impossible task. And let me tell you, it is. It is so epically impossible that there's only one person who has ever lived this kind of life. And he was crucified for it. But that's why he looks at us and says, Hey, you don't have to do this. I will do this through you. If you let me become your filter, then I will be the natural result of what people see. It's not that we try harder. Even revival isn't about that. It's about us submitting, about us aligning, about us saying, okay, Jesus, what do you want to do with this situation? And we dig into his word and we get counsel from other believers. We don't leave any area of our life unfiltered. Relationships, this is, is a lot like this a lot. So many of us get into relationships if we're single or, man, just we allow things into our marriage. A compromise starts, and then what I don't get, and I probably do this in a lot of areas of my life, but somebody will get into a relationship, and then they'll ask God to come bless it. When God was saying, I was blessing something until you went off and did your own thing. Trust me, this wasn't the time. That may have even been the right person, but it wasn't the timing. And a lot of us, we sort of take control of our life and we pull the filter off. We put it back on the kitchen sink instead of at the, the meter coming into our house. We take it off because we want some stuff to get into the house that's unfiltered. Because guess what? It's just like, I don't want to be weird at work. I don't want to Jesus juke everybody. Do you know what Jesus juking is? Somebody just says, man, this burger is so good. And you, you say, oh, praise God that he made cows. Do you know how much, how important that is to God? You know, like you Jesus juke everything. That's not what it's about. But it's about you enjoying life and understanding God's purpose through that. I think David communicates this so powerfully in Psalm 119. Psalm 119 verse 169 if you've never read Psalm 119, uh, it might be a couple days of devotion. But listen to what David says. May my cry come before you, O Lord. Men don't cry, do they? Give me understanding according to your word. So what's the filter of David's understanding of life? God's word. Do you understand life that way? Is the Word of God the filter for the way you build your worldview? Verse 170 says, May my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your promise. So again, he goes back to your Word. He doesn't say, God, I don't know why I would go through something like this. You're supposed to be a good and loving God. Why am I suffering? Well, God's picture is bigger. You're going to go through tough stuff. But if the word of God and uh, Jesus becomes the filter in which you view suffering, then suffering's purpose changes. It's not the purpose of the world where you cry about it all the time. Where you act like everything, you're entitled to everything. How many of you are tired of people acting entitled to what they have? Yeah, most of our hands are going up. Guess what? We made them. All those snot-nosed kids that want to get out of college with a four-year degree and want to make billions right out of college and they won't take another job. Guess what? We made them because we didn't teach them how to filter the world through the, the lens of Jesus and His Word. But listen to what David says in Psalm 171. He said, May my lips overflow with praise. For you teach me your decrees. May my tongue sing your word. For all your commands are righteous. Even the ones you don't like that are tough, that are inconvenient for this time in your life. They're, they're, they're there for us to be in a place where we can sing praise. Because there's praise to be given in every situation of your life. Praise in the suffering. Praise in the great news. Some of the, the craziest news... I've gotten was a couple things. 
I mean, just some crazy stuff. Okay, so I just put my son Parker in college at Lenore Ryan University. He's so smart and so, so awesome that he almost got everything paid for except for housing. That, that one's hurting. But anyways, but then I had this sort of dream, and he still may do this, but he, he was so good at baseball that I played in college, and I saw Parker is way better than me. I, I felt he could play at D1, but some things didn't work out where he didn't even try. But then Angie finds out that he tried out. <laughs> this is going to sound terrible to a lot of us, but he tried out for this video game team. Yeah, no cheers there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but this video game team ended up, he, as a freshman, they would have given him the position of captain, but they couldn't give that to a freshman. And uh, at the end of the year, there, there's this huge tournament that the first prize is $100,000 that'll go towards scholarship. So all of a sudden, video games, I was like, you got this, son. You got this. So that was like, that was like a really weird thing because as a youth pastor, I've preached, because one of the biggest forms of bringing apathy into our world is video games when they're not filtered correctly. If your son sits around and plays video games all day long, his, his, his broad opportunities get very narrow. And Parker wasn't that kid, but he just happened to be just as talented as that as he was at baseball. And I'm totally cool with it if it pays for school. So I found that out. And then um, I'm over it. And a lot of y'all know this. Just a few weeks after that, I find out that my beautiful bride is pregnant with our second son. So, yes, you heard me correctly. Son. Got a boy coming. And that was a shock. We had the gender reveal. And I tell you what, just like I don't understand. I'm having to refilter some things. I'm going, I'm going to be 58 when this kid graduates. Okay. All right. I'm glad I started going back to the gym and I got some of my gym buddies that come and I've got to stay in shape because I will whoop this kid at 18 and I've got to stay in shape to do that. Unless he plays video games all the time, then I don't really have to work out. But see, when Jesus becomes my filter, he's revealed in every area of my life. There's a way to find Jesus to filter everything, and he should. Why wouldn't you want him to? Because you can't see if there's any organisms. You see it's dirty, and maybe you can like get the crunchies out, but you don't know if there's any bacteria in there that may kill you. And we go into the world, and we decide how the filter sh what should be filtered and what shouldn't. I'll write this down. When Jesus becomes my filter, I become a life that gives life. I become a life that gives life. Isn't that what you want to do? Your options are life and death. That's what your life gives. And you don't determine that. Jesus does. So if it's not aligned with Jesus, if it's not filtered by Jesus, something will die because of it. Verse 11 in 2 Corinthians 4, it says... We who are alive always been given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that... His life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, verse 13, I believe, therefore, I have spoken with that with the same spirit of faith. We also believe and therefore speak. Verse 14, Because we know that the one who raised uh, the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us, with Jesus and present us to you in his presence. Now listen very carefully. All of this is for your benefit so that the, that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory. Everybody say God. God. To the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Why? Because we're reaching more and more people. The greater filter that we use in our life, we reach more and more. God will use you greater and greater the more you allow Jesus to permeate and filter the things in your life. And you'll reach more and more. And it will overflow with thanksgiving to the glory of God. Verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Outwardly we are wasting away. Yet inwardly we, be, we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes on what, not on what is seen, 
but on what is unseen. For what is unseen is temporary, but what, uh, for what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. See, our inflow, as it increases, as we take more of God in and Jesus becomes our filter, our outflow reaches more and more people. Ask yourself this question, is the inflow of your life tainted? Because if it doesn't get filtered, what doesn't get filtered? The things that you see, the things that you hear. Listen to what John 7, what Jesus said. It says, On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures has said, streams of living water will, everybody say flow will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit whom those who had believed in him were later to receive. Up until that time the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. See, when Jesus is our filter, the Holy Spirit will flow from within us and into other people. I don't know what else our purpose is than this. Because everything else will eventually be meaningless in the end. And I'm not smart enough to do a bunch of thing, meaningless things and then try to have a kingdom life also. I'm just a country boy from North Carolina. And I just want to say, God, just help me to put every single part of me into you. And you become that filter. Because Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus... Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, I pray that out of His glorious riches He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Do you hear this permeation, this filter, this overtaking of your life? And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints. There's the community. We're filtering ourselves so even together as a body, we become a, a more uh, living force for our community to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. We've got to get to a place where we say, you know what? Jesus, I'm going to allow you to be the filter of everything. And I'll end with a a couple thoughts. As adults, we carry around a different filter than we expect our children to carry. Because this is what society has told us. Back in like the 80s, there was PG and R. Because if you watch the Goonies, it's rated PG. And then you're like, Chunk said what? Well, that was before all the other rating systems that help us categorize and decide when you should hear something. So everything's categorized, and we let society tell us, well, you know, I'm 18 now, rated R movies are okay. Well, if Jesus is the filter, he doesn't care what the rating system says. Well, you know, you shouldn't say that you're a child. It probably shouldn't have come out of your mouth either. You're a child of God. See, isn't it funny how all of a sudden we have these more intricate and holier filters for our children? They're loving this. The kids in the room are loving this at the moment. But then as adults, we have greater liberty. Well, not if you let the Word of God be your filter because it says so much about the way you talk. It says so much about the way that you see. In fact, in your life group this week, you'll talk about the ear gate, the eye gate, and the mouth gate. You're going to talk about those three gates, the way you take things, what you see. You know, there is no appropriate time for uh, nudity to be seen outside of a marriage. There's no. It doesn't become appropriate as an adult. It's not appropriate in secret. It's really not appropriate just to have foul language. And I know we're getting like intricate, but why wouldn't you let Jesus be the filter of your mouth? Guess what? Jesus filters the wallet too. He decides what you do with your money. He decides what you do with your children. 
well, my kids are going to be this, 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 and this. Is that your filter or Jesus's? Because Jesus may say, I need to take them to uh, the, the, the jungles of Africa, to an unreached tribe, and they may even lose their life. What if Jesus said, they will die there, but because of the seed they plant, another missionary will come in, and the gospel will explode if you'll let me be your filter. I'll help you see through that lens. Some of you should surrender to ministry, full-time vocational ministry, but you won't because financially it's not as appealing. But if Jesus becomes that filter, some of us, we all our media intake and our music that we listen to, somebody else is the filter. And we're bringing this into the, our lives and into our family, and we've gotten used to drinking it. We go, it's not that bad. I've seen worse. And we justify things when God is saying, hey, I need to use you. I don't need, God doesn't need any of us. But I want to use you to impact Lowe's. I want to, you to impact your construction company. I want to use you to impact East or Central or West or North. I want to use you to imp impact homeschool. Do you know homeschool needs a filter too? I want to do that, but you've got to get to this place where you surrender to me. So our next step today is just to answer a question. So write this down. What does Jesus need to filter in my life? It's a real simple question that could have profound... And Some of us are list. If, you're, if you answer this question like I'm going to when I get home, because I try to apply what I preach... I'm going to sit down and ask the Lord to show me in my life what I need to filter. And I have a pretty good feeling my list is going to be epically long. And I'll be like, okay, we got some work to do. So that's when I meet with my accountability partner and say, Chris, here's what the Lord showed me. And that's when I go to a life group and I share part of that in my life group and say, hey, can we take this journey together because I need help with my filter. Because sometimes I want to take it off the, the main line of my life and I want to put it on the kitchen. And I need people looking and saying, hey, uh, you got the filter on the kitchen only? Yeah. Yeah, I was, you were sort of being rude and nasty. You need to put the filter at the beginning. So what does Jesus need to filter in your life? Let's uh, stand to our feet as we pray together. I don't know where you are. Maybe the filter doesn't even exist yet in your life because you've never trusted Jesus. And that can happen today. That can happen real simply as you just calling out to, to the Lord and say, Lord, uh, I believe that you died for my sin. And I believe that you paid for it. And I believe that you rose again and overcame sin because that's what the gospel is. The good news is he died for you. He paid for your sin. And he overcame sin, and you can say, Jesus, I want to ask you to be my Lord and Savior. I turn from my way, and I trust you. And if you'll do that this morning, the Bible says that he'll save you. But for the rest of us, I just want to pray this prayer. God, right now, you are revealing to us the areas of our life that need a filter, Lord. As we launch into this series and just talk about being an outflow into the world and we, we examine areas of our life that need filtering. Lord, may fear not overcome our obedience, but may love overcome it. Because perfect love casts out all fear. So Lord, today, this morning, may none of us leave this room without saying, Jesus, be our filter. Be the fear, filter of my media. Be the filter of my addiction. Be the filter of my marriage. Be the filter with my children. Be the filter of my bank account. Be the filter of my job. Because, Lord, I know in a room this size that there's pornography addiction. There's debt because we're addicted to, to buying more and more. Lord, there's marriages that are hanging on by a thread because you've never been the filter of that marriage. Lord, there's some pain in this room that is so deep because the sin has broken us so much. 
that all we need to realize is if we'll allow you to start filtering those things in our life, you will purify us. You will make us healthy. Lord, some of us, our eating's out of control. Our media's out of control. It's just out of control. So, Lord, would you just overflow with your spirit into this room? Overflow and overwhelm. Purify us right now. May we respond with great praise as we sing to you. It's in Jesus' name.